Y'all ready? Good deal. Good deal. So, any um, any military retired or uh, I know there is retired or active in the house? Several of you. Several of you. I I uh, I believe Veterans Day is an important day. Um, I, I've never served in the armed forces, but many of my family members have. My grandfather was in an anti-aircraft division in the Pacific during World War II. He's going to be with the Lord. He didn't die in service, but uh, in military service, but uh, but he served during World War II. My dad served in Europe during Vietnam um, as an officer there. I have a, a very, very close friend. He's a brother to me, really. Uh, he's a bivocational pastor on the East Coast, and he was a Marine for 10 years and served during Desert Storm. Um, they're no longer serving, those men I just mentioned, ones went to heaven. They're no longer serving the armed forces, but there's, there's a part of them, my dad and, and my friend Andy, who's, they're still connected. There's still a connection there, right? Those of you who understand um, that connection. Um, while, in, while in active duty, armed forces personnel stand out among civilians, do they not? I mean, they're different because they have, they have military haircuts, uh, military clothes, live in military housing most often, fed military food, which is so I hear. They're taught military things. They learn to think and to behave like the military wants them to. Why, why do they do that? Why can't they just live where they want and do what they want and dress how they want and think how they want and make whatever decisions they want to make? Well, well they, wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be soldiers if they would, and our nation being a mess, well, it already is a mess, but... <laughs> But there would be no way to defend it if, if they just, you know, if they didn't do that, right? Um, and, and I'm getting at something. Military personnel live out who they are. I mean, they, they, they live different. They stand out because they live different. They live out. They, they, they live out who they are. They live out loud. They stand out in a group. You with me? Okay. And, and, and here's what Jesus said in John chapter, write this one down, John chapter 12, verse 26. If anyone serves me, if anyone serves me, Jesus is the, command, Jesus is the commander, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the fa Father will honor him. We're going to talk about living out loud. We're going to pick it up in verse 13 tonight, where it says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action... And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on Him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear, throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through Him are believers in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Now, again, I'm reading out the English Standard Version for those of you who are curious. And once in a while we look at words and terms and, and try to remember that, add a few in from other translations. Um, but just, just take that as a note. <clears throat> um, we begin in verse 13 with the word therefore, and, and you've often heard it said that's it's there for a reason. It's connecting something. And so what Peter is about to say reaches all the way back to the very first verse. It's from verse 1 through 12 is Based on what he said, here's the rest. Here's some more information. Here's what I want to say based on those first twelve. Now remember again our our background, our context, where we the original believers that Peter's writing to were horribly discouraged. They were struggling with temptations in a corrupt society. The culture around them was so full of sin. It was on a landslide getting worse. I mean, it was rapid depravity. Um, it was not only hard to stay faithful to God and do what was right, it was getting muddier to tell what was right 
I mean, the culture was so saturated. They were, they were, they were struggling. Um, and if you did live right, you were persecuted. They thought, it, originally, they thought Jesus' return was, I mean, imminent, like now. Yeah. They, they thought that, remember, remember we talked about last week, the two mountain peaks? You know, his, his, yeah, the cross and the crown. They couldn't see the gap in between. They thought they were right together. So they thought, based on their understanding of the Old Testament, they thought, falsely, that, <clears throat> um, but again, we don't want to throw them under the bus because God kept it a mystery. They, they, where they couldn't figure it, they thought that Jesus would go to cross, He rose from the dead, He's king, it's over. He's coming back to reign on earth and off we go with heaven and the works. And they, they thought, bare minimum, it would happen in their lifetime. And it has, it's been going on for years and, and wow, they're, they're, they're struggling. What, what's going on? They were like, exiles on a ship in the middle of the sea and they can't see land and there's no wind. And they're in deep in the hull of the boat. Their hearts are sagged with no hope of ever landing on the eternal shore. That's where they're at. And, and, and so what do they do in the meantime? I mean, we give up. Uh, is it over? Um, do we just forget about it? Do we cave in? But think of it this way. Peter, in this letter, Peter's like the lookout in the crow's nest. And, and he's hollering from the crow's nest above the sails to them down below. All of a sudden he shouts, Hey, I see land. You know, man the sails. You know, get the ropes. We're, we're, look out. Here, here, it's, it's there. I see, I see heaven. I see heaven horizon. And um, he was, now, that didn't mean heaven was going to happen in a year or two uh, or even several. He doesn't give them a specific timeline. He could have. Um, but that is not what he meant. He just meant by faith, I can see. I see it. And you should too. Folks, never lose sight of your goal and you won't lose hope. And that's what he's trying to instill in them again. Don't lose sight of that goal. It might not have happened yet. Don't lose sight of it and your hope will remain. So he's explained for them the greatness of God in our first 12 verses and for us. <clears throat> Um, and, and the greatness of God's salvation specifically. He emphasized the inheritance that we'll have on that eternal shore and even some wonderful things we experience here because of redemption. And if you remember when we, when we ended, we talked about even angels hunger to know more, more deeply what we can experience. Even, even they look at it with amazement and excitement about what God's planned for us. So he's emphasized that hope. He's, he's, he's shared it. He's described it. He's declared it. And now what he's going to say is, so live it. Live out that hope. Live it out loud so others can see it. It ought to be obvious you're different. That's what he said. The main verses, or excuse me, I should say, the main question in verses 1 through 12 that we were kind of answering was, how can I remain joyful in the midst of suffering? And the question for this next section that we just read, main question is, how do I remain hopeful in a corrupt society? And that's what he's addressing. Hope. Hope's a major theme of this whole letter. It's a major theme of, of this chapter. One, for sure. I mean, look at it. He says in verse 3, we've been caused, we've caused, been caused to be born into a living hope. See that in verse 3? Look at verse 13. Set your hope fully on the grace that's been given to you. There's hope. Verse 21, your faith and your hope are in God. You see, you see in the connection? You see in the thread? Hope's a big deal. So what we're going to look at uh, next is how we remain hopeful in a corrupt society. And there are, there are three things Peter points out for us. One is... So here's, the, here's what we're looking for, the answer. How do I remain hopeful in a corrupt society? And the first thing Peter is pointing out to us is that we focus our faith on, in Christ. How do we live in that hope? Focus your faith in Christ. What would happen if a farmer took off to harvest a field and he spent the majority of his time watching the deer and other critters running out of the sides of the fields to the woods while he's running his machine? Well, if he 
made it to the edge of the field, <laughs> or to the end of the field, if he made it to the end of the field, he could look behind him and what would he see? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've run tractors all my life, and, and, and mostly here, run hay equipment and bush hogging and that sort of stuff. But I had a chance uh, when I pastored for about six years in North Missouri in, in big time farming country, row crop farming country. I had a lot of farmers in my church and had, a, had my first opportunity to drive a combine. And so I went in with one of my deacons who had a big 2,000 acre uh, farm and, and had me run a combine for it. And I had run tractor equipment, you know, here. That combine was as big as the house I was living in. And had, now, he, he at that point, they, they didn't have all of the GPS gadgets that drive everything for you. So then, you had to drive it. But it had more bells and whistles, and there were instrument panels everywhere you had to keep up with while you're driving it. And I mean, you had to drive it. And I am a hunter, and there was lots of critters in the field. <laughs> Show them where they go. Well, look at that deer, you know. Derek! <laughs> so I, I, had it, I had to learn really quickly to keep my eyeballs focused on the edge of that machine. Um, on the edge of that, or that last row, keep it straight, keep it straight, or I'm everywhere. And of course, if I'm everywhere missing stuff, he's missing money. <laughs> there, were, there was things at stake. Because he needed to go back over it again and burn fuel. We had a great time, but I learned about, a lot about keeping, keeping focused, keeping your focus where it's supposed to be. That, that's really the idea behind this first point and this, this first command of how do we keep our hope. Um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of the idea behind that. Hey, get your focus where it's supposed to be and keep it there. And your focus is supposed to be on Christ. Now, specifically, it's Christ's return. I'm giving away the end point here. But let's look at a little language issues first. <clears throat> Several translations, including the New American Standard Version, if you're reading that, the King James or the New King James Version, give all of the verbs, the verbs, you know what a verb is, right? Okay, they give all the verbs in verse 13 as imperatives. Um, an imperative is a command. It's a standalone sentence, and it's, it's a command to do something. Um, it'd be like, <clears throat> I don't know, Rick, open the door. That's a command. That's an imperative. You with me? It's just, I could say, Rick, open the door, and I don't need to say anything else. Everybody knows what that means. The sentence makes sense. Just you with me? Okay. Well, the, the truth is, there's only one imperative in that verse. The others are participles, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. In fact, there's only three imperatives in, the whole, in this whole passage I just read. Three commands. Here's the three things you do. And, um, and, and in fact, we're, we're touching on, the three, on three points related to that. But... So what that means is this, this first imperative or this first command um, that we have presented to us in verse 13 is hope. Um, some translations say uh, set your hope. Some of your translations will say fix your hope. Um, that's, the main, that's the main idea, right? That's the main verb. That means the other two verbs, being sober-minded and preparing your minds, um, are what supports it or what modifies it. They're, they're what we call participles. You know what a participle is? In English, it's a, it's a verb that has an ing at the end of it. Okay, let me illustrate. <clears throat> Derek went to town driving fast. Okay, so um, Derek went to town. Does that make sense? Do I have to say anything more? Is that a complete sentence? Sure it is. Derek driving fast. Is that a complete sentence? No, it's not. Because it's, there's a, the verb is a participle. So if I say Derek went to town driving fast, what I've just said is how I was driving. I was, if you're with me, okay? It, 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 the, the verb, um, how I went to town is described by driving. Driving is how I went. You with me? Okay? So all that to say this. How I fix my hope is by preparing my mind and being sober-minded. Now do you follow me? He said, so here's how you do it. Those are what, what we... Uh, are described as, or how you perform setting your hope. How do I get my hope focused? Well, it has to do with how you think. All right? So what he's saying is, and, um, and he says specifically, I'm going to get to the other two in a minute. I'm going to get to preparing your mind, being sober-minded, actually, in the next point. But in this first one, let's just focus on that main idea, hope. And your hope is set on what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we've seen that phrase before, too. Did, you, did it look familiar to you? Look over verse 7. You'll find it again. Actually, you'll find it for the first time. Now it's repeated. 
So Peter's writing, and um, he's, he's dictating to Silas what to say as the Holy Spirit moves him. And he's been praising God. This has been a big praise for salvation and what it means and the hope we have. And, and it's, a, it's almost like if you can see it in your mind, he's talking about how wonderful salvation is. And he's just saying, hey, write this down. Holy Spirit's moving. Him. Say this, say this. And it's like he stops. And he takes a big breath and says, fix your hope. You know, in other words, everything I just said about how wonderful God is, that calls us to something. We, we need to live that out. We need to live out what we believe. We, we, because we have that coming to us, and it's been given to us, that ought to affect us. So like a command, he calls us to fix our hope. On what? Well, the, specifically, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're called to live in light of Christ's return. He's coming back. <clears throat> Christians who live in a corrupt society aren't supposed to just endure it with a melancholy attitude. And they sure aren't supposed to be influenced by it. Instead, listen, we're supposed to engage the world with hope. We, we, we live it out loud. We, in other words, we're to, we're to live as a people who know Jesus could come at any minute. And it ought to be evident to those around us that we believe that and we're living differently because of it. And because of that, because we know that this is just temporary, we don't put all our eggs in this basket. We know, why would we want to do that? We, we don't, we're not satisfied with the stuff that's here because we know so much, something so much better is coming. You know, we, we talked about this before in this series. We're talking about it in Daniel too, for that matter. The world around us is a cesspool. Amen. Um, and it's a cesspool of depression and disappointment. And people are trying to satisfy it, as you well know, with everything and anything, and none of it works. And it just leads to more depression and discouragement. When they think they've got the answer and they pursue this as a culture and it doesn't fix it. And what do they do? Well, more of it. <clears throat> until they finally can't do any more of it and they move to something else and it doesn't fix it either. And that's where we're in. Folks just aren't satisfied with anything. But you know what really breaks my heart? Is when I see that in church. When I see churches doing that. When, when Christians live discouraged. When Christians appear to not be satisfied with anything so they complain about everything. And yes, Christians who, because of that, it's because they focus their goals not on the goals that Jesus has for them, but on the things that have no eternal value anyway. <laughs> and Peter's saying, hey, wake up. Get it in the right place. Focus on what we have. So how do I live... Out this hope, how do I live out what I really believe? Well, first, focus your faith in Jesus Christ. Set your hope on His return. And then, secondly, have a healthy mind and, a holy, and live a holy life. Now, combine kind of the support ideas for the first one with uh, our second imperative, and I'll explain as we go. But <clears throat> Peter wants us to realize that he, even though we're surrounded by thousands of temptations and difficult trials, we don't... We don't have to cave in because we don't focus on all this stuff. So, we can focus on something different. How do we focus on something different? Well, look, it's by preparing your mind. We're still in verse 13. By preparing your minds for action. Some of your translations, your older translation, if you're using an older one, reading the King James, says something else. It doesn't say prepare your mind. It says what? See that G word? Gird. Okay. Now, if you're my age or younger, you have no idea what it even means. <laughs> What's a gird? I have no clue, right? <clears throat> All right. So, uh, it's the, the actual word is meant to describe this. You know, in, in those days, you know, what everybody wore, right? So everybody wore tunics and robes. Basically, everybody wore a dress. Many. And these long, flowing clothes, all right? They're always doing this all the time. And so when you had to get to work and really do something, what'd they do? Voila, homemade pants. They'd tie them all up. 
underneath himself so that now they can move without that stuff flowing everywhere and getting in the way and going all over the place. So here we say, gird up your mind. Prepare your minds for action. So when they did this, when they had to do something, they would gird things up. It meant they were prepared for action. So what Peter is saying, prepare your minds to think. Prepare your mind specifically to think seriously. That's what sober-minded means. So these, these two are related terms. So serious thinking. Think seriously. Prepare your mind for action. Folks, listen. This is, this is where it all starts. God cannot have your heart until He first has your mind. What does Romans chapter 2, verse 2 say? Look there, look, look there momentarily. See, the Lord has my heart because He changed my mind. You follow me? I changed my mind about sin. I changed my mind about who He was. Romans 12, 2. Sorry. <clears throat> Romans 12 2. If I said 2, I apologize. <clears throat> 12 2 says, Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by what? Renewing your mind. Which means what? Changing the way you think. This is where it starts. How does Christ disciple you? Changing the way you think. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. <clears throat> Listen, during the darkest days of Christianity, we call the Middle Ages, there was a cultural characteristic that described the Middle Ages and some dark days in Christianity that, that affected Christianity in a negative way during the Middle Ages. Um, Thomas Cahill explains. Let me just read, read, read how he describes it. The intellect, so here's what happened. He says, The intellectual disciplines of distinction, definition, and dialectic that had once been the glory of men like Augustine were unobtainable by readers of the Dark Ages whose apprehension of the world was simple and immediate, framed by myth and magic. A man no longer sub subordinated one thought to another with mathematical precision, but instead he apprehended similarities and balances, types, paradigms, parallels, and symbols. It was a world not of thoughts, but of images. Folks, that's, that's the very characteristic of our day. We, we are living now as a culture in modern times in many ways like they did in the Middle Ages, where... Culture thinks with their eyes, not their heads, not their brains. Culture thinks with what they see. In other words, we are moved to decisions and we make choices and we even frame our politics by the images that we see, not with the intellect. A while back, it wasn't too many, it wasn't too, too long ago, my middle daughter was. I uh, had a college textbook she asked me to look at in a secular school in Missouri. It wasn't all bad, but in this particular class she had a textbook and she had me read a section of it um, to help her with it. And, and as I read it, I was furious because it was opinion after opinion after opinion after opinion by a quote-unquote professor in a textbook arguing against the Bible. Now, that didn't make me angry that he was arguing against the Bible. You don't make me angry? What made me angry was there was no footnotes. There was no research. There was no intellectual logic to it whatsoever. It was only his opinion he was declaring as fact. There wasn't no thinking to it. And that's what I pointed out to her. Look, there's nothing here. There's no evidence to it whatsoever. He's, he's stating as fact how the Bible is wrong, but giving not, he's not even giving evidence for the Bible about how it's wrong. And there's no footnotes, no research, no nothing. It was just how, it was what he declared was truth. Have you heard this modern phrase, I know my truth? Yeah. Folks, there's just one truth. The way and the truth. There's not your truth and my truth, there is the truth. We don't get to define what truth is. He defines what truth is. 
The media can drive anything they want into our culture. For that matter, they can drive our culture by the selected images that they show. <clears throat> I, I've learned, I learned from serving on a, a lot of mission trips never to make judgments about a culture or a situation until I went there myself. And I visited with the people who were there and made some intellectual decisions based on my own evidence of research. Why? Because I couldn't trust what I saw in the media. I realized how, wow, different that was than when you go yourself. And I know we can't do that in every situation. But you follow what I mean? You know, we can, we can, we, we, we as a culture are easily directed because of how we do logic today, which we don't, that's my point. <laughs> we don't do logic. We think with our eyes. Um, and my heart aches that that has made its way so often in the church and in church issues. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the 20th century preacher in London said, 20th century preacher in London said, no true Christian in his right mind will desire anything other than true holiness and righteousness. But, if you want to be holy and righteous, we are told the intellect is dangerous. Yeah. That's a 20th century. So what we do, what, what, what have I seen? What, what, what happens when we do that? That we, uh, we see in, 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 in not all churches, but in many churches that's so disturbing. Well, churches have dumbed down the messages, jettison theological Bible studies, make most of their decisions based on how they feel rather than on intellect, rather than what Scripture says. <clears throat> I can't tell you how many times I, find my, I have found myself in the last few years when somebody comes to me asking for their counsel, saying to them this, look, I'm not asking you how you feel in this decision. I'm asking you, what is the Bible telling you to do? Don't make your decision based on how you feel. Base it on truth. I mean, I have had to repeat that over and over and over again because he, that's what I mean. It's made itself now into the church where believers are making decisions based on feelings rather than on truth. And, and that's what Peter's arguing against. Um, and, and he will even more so as we dig deeper into his letter. Uh, when you base your decisions on feelings and on images, if you will, rather than, uh, or the feelings that come from images, rather than on, on the logic of truth, that's not being sober-minded. That's not serious thinking. That's where he says we start. <clears throat> we will never experience or practice hope. We will never live right in light of Christ's return if we base our life and our decisions on our feelings rather than on truth. The, the first mark of a person who set their hope on heaven is that they've raised their thinking to focus on truth. Now the second mark, <clears throat> we pick it up in verse 14, the second mark of a person who set their hope on Jesus is they live holy lives. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, as you've been, um, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. <clears throat> be holy is our second imperative. It describes how we live but it still describes how we live out our hope. Um, notice in verse 14, even believers, we're obedient children, but notice it says, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. What's that tell you? It tells you you could be. If he's telling you not to be, it tells you and reminds us, and we know although it's true, that we are still beckoned by, our, by the ungodly desires of our old life. Are we not? We go and be honest. How many times are we tempted with stuff from that we're like, what in the world am I even thinking that for? Yeah. You know, why would I even want that? <clears throat> you know, arguing with ourselves. Well, we, we, it's still, we're still capable of, of, of being beckoned by that. Those sensual impulses, those evil longings, those uncontrolled appetites. Now, those are practiced by unbelievers and who have no choice. They don't know any different. They, they can't. They, they, they can't, they don't know any better, so they can't act any better. The lost act how? Lost. That's, that's, that's their worldview. That's the center of who they are. But, but believers, listen, the difference between us and them is not that we're better, it's that we have the ability to choose. Because regeneration, the new life, brings new desires that are now implanted in us and the power by the Holy Spirit to actually choose not to do it. 
Listen, you don't sin because you have to. You sin because you choose to. And yep, sometimes I choose wrong. I have to ask His forgiveness and get me back on track. <clears throat> and that's what Peter is saying. Look, <coughs> stay out of the ditch. <laughs> Think. Yeah, here's what I found. Most of the time when that happens to me, I'm not thinking. Right? Isn't that true? Most of the time, when I do stumble into a essential desire from the old life or whatever, you know what I'm saying. When I'm doing something I know I shouldn't be or thinking the way I shouldn't be thinking, even thinking the way I should be thinking, I'm not really thinking. Not logically. Not biblically. Not on truth. I'm just letting it happen. I've not brought those thoughts under the obedience of Jesus Christ. And that's a choice. So, <clears throat> he's saying... Live holy. What does holy mean? Holy means, we've talked about this before too, it means set apart. It's like holy matrimony means what? The two of you are set apart for, for marriage. For set apart from what you were, set apart from everybody else to be together as one. Um, same idea. So when he says, be holy for I am holy, what is he saying? He says, basically, it means basically this. Hunger for what God hungers for. Model his character. <clears throat> Let me pause. Where do I? Where, how do I know what that is? Point one. <laughs> Raise your thinking to truth. It's in the book. So, focus your attention on his priorities. Um, it, 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 listen, it doesn't mean when he's being set apart. Listen to me. It doesn't mean set apart physically from the world completely. In fact, Jesus prayed that in his last prayer before the cross. You remember how he prayed that? Lord, don't take them out of the world. Let them be different from the world. They need, they need them in the world or they can't witness to who I am. So when he says we're set apart, it doesn't mean that we're <clears throat> retreating completely from the world. We shouldn't do that. It would never be a witness. But what he's saying, rather, is we live differently from the world even while we're in it. And even if it costs in other words, if, listen, if there is separation from the world, it's because the world drove us out, not because we chose to leave. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 11. Um, just, just, you can just write this down, look it up later. Verse 43 through 45, so just listen to me. It says, God is saying, do not render, it's where it comes from, he says, be holy for I am holy. And if you've been reading through the Bible, especially in Leviticus and Numbers, you'll see that repeated. God said, be holy for I am holy, be holy for I am holy. Here's one of those. Do not render yourselves detestable through any of the swarming things that swarm, and you shall not make yourselves unclean with them so that you become unclean. Now listen, that doesn't really matter to us at the moment. Focus on the principle, not the Jewish issue. Hmm. Here, he says, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, and therefore be holy, for I am holy. Then he tells them some other. He says, Don't make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things on earth. How, what's a modern day principle for us? Don't be doing what the world's doing. That's basically what that means here. It didn't mean don't play with bugs. <laughs> okay. For us, in, in, in our New Testament, the New Testament principle is, don't commit the stuff that we know is wrong to God that the world's committing, but be holy, be set apart, live different, for I am holy. This last phrase, he says, For I am the Lord, verse 45, For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God, thus you will be holy, for I am holy. For us, he's saying, I am the God who brought you out of hell, which is where you were headed. I brought you out of the slavery of your sin, the bondage of your sin. I brought you out of darkness, put you into light, so be holy. Live like you... Hey, listen, I saved you. Live like you're saved. That's what he said. You know, when you want to buy some jewelry, for example, you want to buy some gold or silver jewelry, you, you walk in today, you usually walk into this attractive store. It's all nice, clean, and neat. Yep. Greeted by this well-dressed professional. Everything in there is clean and sophisticated. But that's not how that gold got started, was it? Because if you could track back the metal to its origins, you'll find a dark, filthy, dangerous mine. And you'll see some crushing and some smelting and a whole lot of intense heat to purge that metal so it becomes pure so that therefore it can be presented as nice and clean. Uh, here's what Proverbs 25 says, verse 4 and 5. <clears throat> Remove impurities from silver and a vessel will be produced for a silversmith. 
remove the wicked from the king's presence and his throne will be established in the righteous. So, in other words, what, what, here's what God's saying. God wants to separate the filth out of our lives. And there, so that we might be different. And he doesn't want us to live like the world who just says, feel good, keep it positive. <laughs> doesn't work. David Helm says this. He says, whenever we continue grasping for the pleasures of the world, we reveal to the world and to God that we place too little value on the grace that is to be ours with the second coming of Christ. And that digs a little bit, doesn't it? He says, when we hunger after the things the world is hungering for, we are revealing to the world and to God that we're, placing, we're not placing much value on what He has for us, on the grace He's been given to us, and the rewards He will give us when we get home. In other words, what does He say? We are hungry for the world, we're not hungry for heaven. The third, embrace the motivation. This is how what you do. And I just, this first phrase in verse 14, as obedient children. Now, pick it up again um, in uh, verse 17. If you call on Him as what? Father. You see the family stuff there going on? See the family terms, children, Father? I remember well these words. I just let, I visited with Mom and Dad a few minutes ago. Um, and and I, uh, just, I, I love just, just hanging with them. But I remember these words well. Derek, Alan, when you get the middle name, you know what's coming, right? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? The middle name's only used when you're in trouble. <laughs> Derek Allen, wait till your dad gets home. <laughs> now my, my, mom was a, my mom was a stay-at-home mom until uh, my, I'm the oldest of three. The youngest, when she went into school, mom went back and went, went back to college, got her teaching degree, and then retired as a teacher. But until the last one was in school, she's a stay-at-home mom. I'm not arguing that everybody needs to do that or not. I'm just, that was my experience. So that's why we were home with mom when we were little. And when I heard that phrase, wait till your dad gets home, that usually worked <laughs> in correcting whatever needed to be corrected in me. Because I feared one of two things. Either his discipline that was coming or his disappointment. What Peter's saying here is using, in using these, your children of the Heavenly Father, the first motivation to be holy is that God's your Father. In other words, there ought to be a family resemblance. That's the home you're in. We're in the family of God, so live like it. That ought to motivate you to be holy. He's holy. Daddy's holy, so live like that. That's what he's saying. Related to that is this. It's about wait till your dad gets home. <laughs> Statement is, the second motivation is that the Father has impartial judgment. He, he judges, verse 17, impartially according to each one's deeds. Therefore, conduct yourself with fear throughout your time of exile. Remember what exile means. We're, we're elected exiles. just means that we're, we're in the world, but we're not the same home. Okay? So, the, the Father, he says, is our, has impartial judgment. By the way, here's our last imperative. Conduct yourselves with fear. Uh, the word conduct, some of your translations say live out or live. Uh, that's what it means. So, live out in fear or conduct your life with fear. Fear is an adverbial, that's an adverbial phrase describing how we live. So, we live in fear or we conduct ourselves with fear. Now, wait, wait. It's not, it's not terror. Okay, that's not what we mean by fear. It's not terror. It's a healthy reverence, a healthy, fearful reverence for God, which, listen, which maintains confidence. What do I mean by that? I mean, if I'm doing what He wants me to be, I have confidence because I know He would judge rightly. Does that make sense? I know if I'm doing, if I'm holding the line, then I have confidence because God is in, He's perfect in His judgment. He plays no favorites. He'll judge right. He's not impartial. He don't play favorites. He will judge right. I have confidence things will be well. Are you well done if I'm doing it right? Because that's how God judges. So it's a, but if I know, but I know, if I don't, there are consequences. I wasn't terrified of Dad. I had a fearful reverence of Dad. And in, in, in our particular home, a healthy respect for him. A confident driver. 
Think of it this way. A confident driver has a healthy fear of accidents. So he or she drives well. Because I don't want to wreck. They know there's consequences if I'm not paying attention. That's what they do. So what is it that we are supposed to be concerned about specifically? Well, why would we want to have that healthy respect or that fear, if you will? And that is we are concerned about the judge and the judgment. The Father who judges and the fact that a judgment is coming. Listen, we have an intimate relationship with God our Father, so that, that should be telling. Um, but we also know, listen, we're accountable for our actions. Even believers are still accountable for our actions. Um, our works reveal our faith. How we live reveals what we believe. And we're conscious of that. And by the way, we know that there is a judgment of works for believers. That there is a judgment coming for us. And the judgment of those works does not gain us access into heaven. It, it, it rather um, defines what our rewards will be when we get to heaven. Not everybody's getting the same thing. And it's not that we want something better than somebody else. We just don't want to. I don't want to sweep streets if I don't have to. You think we're all going to be playing harps and singing all day? There's a new heaven and a new earth, right, Dave? There's a new, there's a new, wow, there'd be, we're going to live life like we should have from the garden. It's a lot to do. Exciting. It is exciting. And there's no, listen, and you don't have to sleep because you won't need that anymore. And, and because your bodies will be perfect and your hair won't fall out and you still have your teeth. And, and you won't get tired and there's no ticks, praise God, or at least none that bite you. <clears throat> Every, you follow me? It's going to be, there's lots to do. And we will be rewarded and assigned, based assigned there based on our works here. So there's a lot at stake, but that's not the primary. That's just the second motivation. There's an even bigger motivation. Peter says that's, that he spends more verses on. Okay. Um, first, first Corinthians three twelve through fifteen. I think it's on the back page, but. Um, it's just a reminder of our works um, before I move on to that more important reverence. I say write these down once in a while. It's, you can just flip on the back if you see it written there. You don't necessarily have to. It's there for you. Once in a while I may give you one that's not on there, so just double check. Um, that's what that's for. If I use a support text to the main thing, then it's usually on the back. But you can always check. But here's one of them. If anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, this is 1 Corinthians 3, 12, each one's work will become obvious for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he's built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost, but he will be saved. Yet it will be like escaping through fire. Did you follow that? So that's our judgment of works. Okay, so I'm going to test it. And, um, and I will reward accordingly. And if your works don't pass the test, you're still saved. But you'll wish that it passed the test. <laughs> so, here, here's the, but here's the bigger motivation um, where he picks up here in the end of verse, or in verse 18. Here's the, other, here's the third and the most important motivation. Knowing that you were ransomed from the few... Why do we live holy? Because we know we were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers, not with perishable things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Um, he, was, he was crucified. He was raised from the dead, verse 21 says. In other words, why do we want to do that? Because Jesus died for the sins we committed and the sins we commit now. And he felt the nails. They were real. He took the wrath for that word and that thought and that action and that thing I did. Do I really need any other motivation? I mean, <clears throat> Stephen Curtis Chapman um, wrote a, a song, a contemporary song, a Christian song. Actually, it's probably two decades ago now. But he wrote a uh, contemporary song that was titled, it was titled Live Out Loud. That's where I took the title for the lesson today. And here's what he says. <clears throat> it's, this is a phrase from his song. He said, imagine this. I get a phone call from Regis. 
Y'all know what he's talking about? Yeah, some of you do. You younger ones have no idea. Remember, remember the remember the Regis? Yeah. And he says, "Do you want to be a millionaire?" That was the show. Remember that? Do you want to be a millionaire? And so you can pick any other show. Just think of the principles here. He says, "So he puts me on the show, and I win with two lifelines to spare." You remember that? You had three lifelines. You could use this, choose this, but you win. You didn't even use but one. He says, "Now think about this. I bury all the money in a coffee can." He says, I've been given more than Regis ever gave away. Then he says in the chorus, this life we've been given, it should be lived out, so live it out loud. We've been given more than this world could ever give us in any material thing, ever. And Stephen Curtis Chapman's right, so we ought to live it out and live it out loud. And Peter's calling us here, hey, live out who you are. My friends, teenagers are begging for people to show them what it means to live with integrity. Uh, uh, uh. Our world needs us to live out who we are. Because they have no idea how to live with integrity. And, and we, we, we've been given so much, how could we not reveal what we have been given and where we know we're going, because that's the thing. Listen, we live in a lot of the hope of, that we have received. We, we need to live focused on our heavenly home. If you want to defeat <clears throat> depression and discouragement and deception and temptation and whatever else, then set your ship toward the port, port of heaven. Stay in a crow's nest focused on the horizon. Heaven's coming. Think and act. Think and act. Like you're headed for your heavenly home. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for your encouraging words from Peter in this letter today that were written centuries ago, but speak to us out loud today. So timely so true as you were. Father, we, uh, it appears we, we so, so many similarities between what the original audience was facing. Um, and, and it's really because there's nothing new under the sun. Satan's you know, come up with new sins, just different spins on them. And so we face the same thing. And we, we just mentioned, Lord, a culture that's just spiraling out of control. And doesn't know how to live with integrity, declares it doesn't want integrity, not really. Um, or rather, it just wants to define what that is, and, and it's not, because as we mentioned, Lord, we're, we're a culture driven not to think, but to just feel, and feelings are deceptive. Feelings can be good, but, but, but Lord, feelings can be deceptive. Truth is truth, and you've given that to us, and we're thankful. We thank you for the Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is the way and the truth and the life. Our only hope toward heaven. And Lord, having received that as a believer, that gracious, gracious gift, should motivate us to keep our focus in the right place. To keep our desires in the right place. To live out the hope we have. Thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity we have to gather together <coughs> freely here this evening and study your precious word together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.